Okay, then let's get to the Yaroslavl Uprising. These are not always in chronological order. I honestly would have preferred to put these in chronological order, but I kind of have to explain these in the order that kind of makes logically the most sense. So, the Union of Revival created by the SRs, Mensheviks, capitalist parties like the Cadets and Octobris, with the support of the Entente Imperialist that was already in the works since February 1918, there were British forces in Murmansk already since March 1918. Most of the counter-revolutionary uprisings started in April or July. Yaroslavl was in July, it wasn't the earliest one, but it was probably the biggest one and the most serious one, so I'll discuss that now, because that gives me the ability to sort of tie everything together. And then of course, the British forces finally land en masse in Arkhangelsk in August 1918. So we're kinda skipping back and forth in terms of time, but I'll try to make that as clear as possible. Victor Serge writes in his uh, book on the Russian Revolution, quote, The leaders of the counter-revolutionary parties, SRs, Mensheviks and Cadets, set up a common organization, the League for Revival, Soyuz Vozrozhdenya. The League, one of the SR leaders has written, entered into regular relations with the representatives of the Allied missions at Moscow and Vologda. The Allied embassies were originally in Moscow, but then a bunch of them moved to Vologda later. He continues, mainly through the agency of M. Nulans, diplomatic representative of France. With the reservations of hypocrisy, no direct cooperation between the Central Committee and the Allies was envisaged, only a cooperation from the activists, which would not officially commit the parties." Unquote. So that means that, especially the Mensheviks, but also some of these other parties, they had their members participate in this, but they wanted plausible deniability for their parties. He continues, the League for Renewal was the main clandestine organization of the so-called socialist petty bourgeoisie and the liberals who were determined to overthrow the Soviet government by force. In Moscow, the Octobrists, representing the big bourgeoisie, joined the organization and linked it with the Right Center, a united front of reactionary tendencies inspired by the generals Alexeyev and Kornilov. The Octobrist party was to the right of the Constitutional Democrats, that is cadets, there was thus a chain of counter-revolutionary organizations running uninterruptedly from the most so-called advanced socialists to the blackest reactionaries. In other words, from the Mensheviks to the SRs to the Trudoviks to the cadets and to the Octobrists and to the monarchists. The military commission of the SR party organized the League's so-called combat groups whose command was entrusted to a general. The League's political platform rested on three points. One, the impossibility of a purely socialist government, two, the Constituent Assembly, three, as a provisional measure, a directory invested with dictatorial authority. The local committee of the League in Petrograd was composed of two popular socialists. The popular socialists were a party similar to the right SRs, but they were even more right-wing. One SR, named A.R. Gotz, the leader of the party, one cadet, Pepe Liyaev, who was to be one of Kolchak's ministers, and two Mensheviks, Patrasov and Razanov. In June, M. Nulans sent the League a semi-official note from the Allies approving of its political program and promising it military assistance against the German Bolshevik enemy. The Allied representatives had conceived a large-scale plan of operations whose success would have ended Soviet rule. Arising by the Czechoslovak forces in the Ural and Volga regions, and in Siberia was to coincide with a series of counter-revolutionary coups in the towns near Moscow and with the landing of the Japanese at Vladivostok and the British at Arkhangelsk. Starved, encircled and demoralized by a swift succession of defeats, the two workers' capitals, that is Petrograd and Moscow, would fall. Order would have been restored. A former officer from the French military mission in Russia, Pierre Pascal, who subsequently became a devoted and serious revolutionary, has explained the plan in these terms. He says, The insurrection at Yaroslavl and the Czechoslovak Rising were organized with the direct collusion of the agents of the French mission and of M. Nulans. The mission was in constant relations with the Czechs, to whom it sent officers and funds. The counter-revolutionaries were to seize Yaroslavl, Nizhny Novgorod, Tambov, Murom and Voronezh in order to isolate and starve out Moscow. This plan began to be implemented with the insurrections in Yaroslavl, Murov, Tambov, etc. I can still see General Laverne 
sketching a large circle with his finger on the map around Moscow and saying, that's what Nulans wants, but I shall feel guilty because if our plan succeeds, the famine in Russia will be terrible, unquote. A capitalist historian named Germanis writes that, quote, Uprisings and attempts at rebellion occurred in several cities on the upper Volga, Yaroslav, Murom, Rybinsk, which were organized by the Union for the Defense of the Fatherland and Freedom under the leadership of the right-wing socialist revolutionary Boris Savinkov, unquote. The so-called Union for the Defense of the Fatherland and Freedom was another one of these counter-revolutionary organizations which was in alliance with the so-called League of Revival. And Brovkin himself writes the following, quote, Boris Savinkov, before 1917 an SR terrorist, in 1917 a commissar for the provisional government, played an important role in the Kornilov Putsch in 1917 and in the preparation of the July 1918 Yaroslav uprising, unquote. An SR writer Argunov writes that, quote, According to the plans of the Union, the sporadic armed clashes with the Bolsheviks, which at this time were occurring here and there, and were being easily crushed by the Bolsheviks, were to give way at the most opportune moment to concentrated action on a large scale in a number of large cities simultaneously. The arrival of the Allies in more or less sufficient numbers was considered to be such a moment. From its very inception, the Union maintained regular relations and frequent contacts with the representatives of the Allied missions at Moscow, Petrograd and Vologda, mainly through the French ambassador Nulans. The Allied representatives were fully informed as to the aims of the Union and its membership, and quite frequently expressed their readiness to help in every way." Unquote. A good indication of the composition of these groups is that Savinkov, he was also the right-hand man of White General Kornilov, who was not a socialist of any kind and advocated military dictatorship, and whose many allies were monarchists. Extreme anti-communist historian Shapiro describes the Savinkov organization in the following way, quote, The Union for the Defense of the Fatherland and Freedom included some extreme right-wing socialists, and the chief of staff was a monarchist. Unquote. The SR, Menshevik, and White Guard conspirators had managed to infiltrate the Soviet apparatus in Yaroslavl to prepare their counter-revolutionary plot. Quote, the former SR terrorist Boris Savinkov had formed another organization, the Fatherland and Freedom Defense League, which aimed to group the most advanced and pugnacious elements of the counter-revolution on a platform sufficiently vague to satisfy both monarchists or radically minded officers and the SR intellectuals. The League proceeded to install its men in the Soviet institutions concerned with food supply, the militia and the army that was now in formation. All these clandestine associations received indiscriminate encouragement from the Allies." Unquote. This is what a Soviet historian Galkin writes, quote, at that time, many dark and hostile elements that sought to decompose and weaken the Soviet power in Yaroslavl attached themselves to the Soviet apparatus in order to be able to easily overthrow it at the moment of rebellion. In the Provincial Executive Committee, a leading role was played by a certain Dobrokotov, a man clearly hostile to the Bolshevik party and Soviet power. Enemies also took over the leadership of the Land Department, Gubchek, gubernial military registration and enlistment office. With the support of these enemies, Savinkovites took over the most important posts. So, for example, an assistant chief of an artillery warehouse was Colonel Lebedev, the head of the Yaroslavl Department of the Union, that is, Savinkov's organization. Commissioner of police there was warrant officer Falalev, an active participant in the White Guard mutiny. Secretary of the District Military Conference, Olshanovsky, simultaneously performed the role of a courier communicator between the Moscow and Yaroslavl conspirators. Unquote. The Savinkov organization was originally based in Moscow, and originally they had organized a plot there, but it was discovered by the police, so then they had to flee, and then they tried again in Yaroslavl. Conspirators even tried to worm their way into the Bolshevik Party organization. Galkin writes that, quote, Comrade Nakimson, so that the Soviet apparatus in the city is littered with alien elements that are enemies who made their way into the ranks of the Bolshevik organization. About these hostile elements, Comrade Nakimson said, These are not communists. They mean nothing. They have nothing in common with the communists. They represent a purulent abscess on the body of a party organization. Unquote. 
And as Victor Serge points out, during the actual uprising, quote, several commissars, including one Bolshevik, went over to the whites, unquote. Which, of course, means that that person was not a Bolshevik to begin with, they were an enemy infiltrator, and the others who were not Bolsheviks, they were left SRs, who were even more infiltrated. Savinkov himself said, quote, We had our agents in the Sovnarkom, so that's the commissariat, the Cheka, that's the political police, the Bolshevik staff and similar institutions, unquote. Galkin writes that, quote, the main combat force of the counter-revolutionary mutiny in Yaroslavl was the old officers from the Tsarist army, many of whom were left in the region from dissolved army institutions, like the Yaroslavl Province Army Research Institute. Individual departments and units of the 12th Army constituted the fighting force of the Yaroslavl Department of the Union for the Defense of the Motherland and Freedom. Some of these officers were connected with the families of Princess Golitsyn, Gagarin, Odintsov, Counts Meyer, Nirod, etc., who, before the revolution, had estates and lands in the Yaroslavl province." Unquote. Capitalist historians also typically describe the entire revolt, or at least the role played by Savinkov as an officer mutiny, because it was mostly carried out by old Tsarist officers. Galkin continues, quote, Savinkov waited for orders from the English and French embassies, on the eve of departure to Yaroslavl, Savinkov received a telegram from Nulans from Vologda. This telegram confirmed that the foreign troops will land in Arkhangelsk between July 4th and 10th, and it was categorically suggested to start an uprising in the upper Volga precisely in those days. The conspirators believed that the White Guard riots in Rybinsk, and especially in Murom, would distract military forces of the Soviet Republic away from Yaroslavl." Unquote. This didn't really go exactly according to plan, because although they started these counter-revolutionary uprisings, the British, French and American forces were not able to arrive in time to save the White Guard uprisings. The counter-revolutionaries were able to use the Czech Legion to try to aid the White Guards, and the Czechoslovak Legion actually did uh, successfully help numerous counter-revolutionary uprisings in the Volga region, but they did not uh, reach Yaroslavl in time. A Russian historian named Neumark writes that White officer, quote, Ratchenko, a former captain of the Priobrzezhinsky regiment under the Tsar, was sent to Rybinsk by Savinkov's organization with the task of organizing an anti-Soviet uprising in the city, unquote. Provkin and some other anti-communist historians say that all these uprisings, they just happened organically in these different places, but from all this evidence and these sources, we can clearly see that they were all, or significant part of them, were organized by Tsarist officers according to a common plan made with the uh, Entente imperialists. About the Yaroslav uprising, Galkin writes, quote, Who did these conspirators rely on? Whose interest did they express? Who supported them? The force they relied on were the landowners, the bourgeoisie, and their lackeys, the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries, that is, the SRs. Before the revolution of 1917 in Yaroslavl, there was a strong organization of Black Hundreds headed by Katsarov. They were also called ardently Slavic Black Hundreds. The Black Hundreds obviously were these proto-fascist, anti-Semitic, monarchist uh, groups consisting of uh, basically far-right, nationalist, Kind of like street gangs, similar to the brown shirts, and they consisted mostly of criminals, the police, and uh, bribed elements. Since before the revolution in Yaroslavl, there had been a very big Black Hundred organization, and this organization included a variety of social elements merchants, priests, storekeepers, all kinds of D classed elements. After the victory of the proletariat in October 1917, significant Black Hundreds personnel remained in Yaroslavl. They actively participated in the organization of the rebellion. A so-called mentor of the Katsorians, that is the Black Hundreds, was the Yaroslav Metropolitan Agafangel, who from the pulpit cursed the Bolsheviks. Literature consisting of slanderous fabrications of the Metropolitan Agafangels were taken by the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries and were heard throughout the city. The Yaroslav Zemstvo, that is a pre-revolutionary municipal organ, stood at the head of the local counter-revolutionary forces. In November 1917 there was a meeting of the Provincial Zemstvo Council at which Cadet A.M. Kisner called on the Zemstvo people to fight against the Soviet power. <laughs> 
The report and speeches at this meeting were filled with slanderous fabrications against the address of the Council of People's Commissars and especially the Red Guards, unquote, and gave its support to the reactionary Kerensky organization called the Committee for Public Order. Kerensky had created this organization basically to stamp out the revolution and implement a military dictatorship. In Yaroslav, the reactionaries, black hundred elements, under various guises, even in Menshevik or clerical processions, fired at communists and workers and provoked violent clashes. In Vladimirskaya, the clergy fired at workers with a machine gun from a church bell tower. According to a Russian historian named Kidyarov, the church was among the strongest supports of the counter-revolutionaries. He writes, quote, it should be noted that during the period under review, the Yaroslavl diocese occupied one of the leading places in Russia in terms of the number of clergy and parishioners. In 1917, 1,640 Orthodox churches and 28 monasteries operated in the Yaroslavl region. The clergy had a strong influence on the broad masses of the population. Long before the events of July 1918, the Yaroslavl clergy expressed quote-unquote counter-revolutionary sentiments. Thus, on January 22nd, 1918, a crowd of the bourgeoisie, clergy and other dark elements tried to organize street riots of a pogrom nature. Filling the streets of the city center, the crowd tried to beat up Soviet workers passing through the streets. The crowd was dispersed by a detachment of soldiers under the command of Comrade Gromov. A similar pogrom demonstration was organized on January 17th under the guise of a religious procession. Before the start of the White Guard Rebellion, the leader of the uprising, Colonel A.P. Perkorov, who was one of Savinkov's associates, personally asked for a blessing from Metropolitan Agafangel Preobrazhensky of Yaroslavl and Rostov. In the basements of monasteries, wrote R. Palashov, food and weapons were hidden. When suppressing the White Guard Rebellion only in the Spassky Monastery in Yaroslavl, the Red Army soldiers discovered 6,000 pounds of grain and a lot of weapons were captured at Tolga. In the last days before the mutiny, as it later turned out, a lot of white officers were hiding in the monastery cells. One of the participants in the summer events in 1918, D. Malinin, wrote, From the very beginning of the October Revolution, the Yaroslavl clergy was actively counter-revolutionary. The priests called on Orthodox Christians to repent and take communion before entering the battle with the Bolsheviks. The same calls were heard from the lips of the clergy in the July days. In addition, in order to raise the spirit of the so-called defenders of Yaroslavl, that is, the counter-revolutionaries, which began to quickly fall, the priests served prayers to the Lord God throughout the rebellion for victory and defeat of the hated Bolsheviks. Some of the most ardent priests did not limit themselves to this and took an active part in the battles. Thus, after the mutiny at Spolye Station, the priest of the Vladimir Church was shot like a machine gunner firing from a machine gun from the bell tower of his church. Not only the clergy of Yaroslavl itself, but also the clergy of the surrounding villages took part in the July events of 1918. In Murom, where members of the Union for the Defense of Motherland and Freedom also organized an uprising, the clergy supported the rebels. According to the testimony of novice Bishop Mitrofan V. Aleksinsky, White Officer Saharov often went to the bishop. On the eve of the uprising, Saharov visited the bishop. They said how good life was under the Tsar and everything was cheap. The Bolsheviks brought Russia to the point of destruction and that they need to be driven out of power. Then it will be better for us to live. They brought it to the point that there is no bread and the people are starving and all this is because of the Bolsheviks." Unquote. So far from this, we have learned that Yaroslavl had a large concentration of black hundreds and was also possibly the leading clerical center in the whole country. So it had more clergy and priests, more churches and monasteries than probably any other part of the country. And that the church actively took part in the white conspiracy to the point that they even allowed monasteries and churches to be used to hide food and weapons for the white guards. The white guards even hid inside the monasteries. And then obviously the church tried to use religion to turn the population against uh, the Soviet government. Were the white guards able to gain any popular support from the local workers and peasants? Well, we shall see. The Mensheviks afterwards claimed that the rebellion was not their doing and they wanted to escape any responsibility from it, but in actuality they did participate in it and they were also members of the Union of Renewal which helped in organizing it. Galkin writes, quote, 
The Mensheviks diligently helped the White Guards and the social revolutionaries. Mensheviks, right and left social revolutionaries, united in the so-called Committee for the Salvation of the Motherland and Revolution with the manufacturers, that is, capitalists, Vakromiev, Dunaev, Pashtukov, Merchant, Postyanikov and others for a joint fight against the Soviet authorities. In counter-revolutionary activities, the Mensheviks tried their best to find support among workers in small enterprises, among workers with backward sentiments, among the petty bourgeois straight out of the city. The Mensheviks had some influence among some station workers at the Urok, railway workshops, the printing house. The influence of the Mensheviks was explained by a strong change in the composition of workers during the years of the imperialist war. During the war, workers with revolutionary tempering and the experience of the revolutionary struggle were taken away to the front or arrested by Tsarism. Their places were predominantly occupied by people from the declassed, that is, ruined, Kulak, Strada, and the city's petty bourgeoisie." Unquote. Provkin claims that Yaroslavl was always a stronghold of Menshevism. Maybe it was, although Galkin certainly claims that uh, Yaroslavl had a stronger and more progressive labor movement before the World War. And also from other sources we can see that the main support of the Mensheviks was not really among uh, workers proper, but among the petty bourgeoisie and also uh, certain handicraftspeople and some uh, more limited sections of the working class, but not really the workers generally. However, Brovkin claims that although Menshevik organizations generally stagnated everywhere in the country in 1917 and 1918, in Yaroslavl the size of the Menshevik party organization actually tripled after the October Revolution, which is highly anachronistic. Now this might be because the October Revolution galvanized the backward workers to fight against it and then join the Mensheviks, but the more likely explanation is that the Mensheviks aggressively recruited shopkeepers and other petty bourgeois to desperately increase the membership of their organization, or possibly like happened with the right SRs in Arkhangelsk and some other places, white officers from other regions joined it to use it as a cover. It certainly seems from other sources that the working class movement was weak in Yaroslavl, which was a more rural and clerical center, with a strong anti-Semitic Black Hundred influence. Galkin writes that, quote, Mensheviks assured Savinkov that they and all their supporters will support the rebels, will oppose Soviet power, and will be the foundation of the uprising, unquote. The Mensheviks tried to organize workers into an anti-communist armed detachment, by lying to them, telling them that the rebels were not actually white guards, that they did not kill communists, that they did not know what kind of government would be created in Yaroslavl by the rebels. Although, of course, in reality they did know that they were supposed to set up a military dictatorship, which they said would be temporary, but the temporary nature of said dictatorship is doubtful. They also lied to the workers by claiming that these anti-Bolshevik armed units would be organized uh, only to protect buildings from banditry, etc., and not to fight the Bolsheviks. But they managed to persuade only a few workers to join their guard, and even they immediately left when they realized what was actually going on. Quote, On the evening of the first day it hit us, the first disappointment, the workers did not come, wrote White General Gopper in his memoirs. The first disappointment was followed by a second, the first Soviet regiment, on the neutrality of which Perkrov had hoped for, came to the defense of the Soviet power. Unquote. So according to the white officers themselves, they were not able to get the workers on their side. And Victor Serge writes, quote, The whites had been promised the support of several hundred workers. In the event, they got hardly a few dozen, unquote. The white guards also tried to threaten peasants in the villages to join the Yaroslavl uprising, but only a few joined, even after threats, and they quickly started to desert and run away from the whites, according to Galkin. This information is also confirmed by Germanis, who quotes uh, from the white general Gopper's. He says, quote, The leaders of the uprising had hoped that the Yaroslav workers would actively support them, but they did not. Further, the number of peasants who joined the uprising was smaller than hoped for, and part of them later straggled back to their homes, unquote. To attract to their side at least the city shopkeepers, the white guards announced that, quote, all obstacles to trade will be eliminated." Unquote. The counter-revolutionaries also heavily relied on deception and dishonest propaganda. Quote, In terms of lies, Perkorov's scribblers surpassed all limits, 
For example, Savinkov's counter-revolutionary rebellion in Rybinsk was suppressed on July 7th, but the White Guard headquarters reported on July 9th that in Rybinsk there is an armed uprising against the Soviet government which is developing successfully." Unquote. This information is also verified by Germanis, who states that Savinkov's organization made the following demagogic and deceitful proclamations. Quote, we are acting in cooperation with the Northern and Samara governments and are under the command of General Alexeyev. The Northern Army is under the command of Boris Savinkov, an old revolutionist. Moscow is now surrounded in a closed circle." Unquote. And Germanis comments on this saying that, quote, no Northern Army existed at that time and the rest of the claims were also far from reality. Unquote. General Alexeyev was of course another white general acting in collusion with the Yaroslavl counter-revolutionaries. The northern government refers to the government that the British would uh, set up in Arkhangelsk and the Samara governments refer to the counter-revolutionary governments uh, set up with the Czechoslovak Legion. Germanis continues, Savinkov's group further said, quote, the Soviet of People's Commissars is not only in complete accord with the German imperialists, but is carrying out unhesitatingly all their orders and demands. The People's Commissars, having long since betrayed the cause of the working class and knowing that the wrath of the people is terrible, now depend on the bayonets of the Germans, down with the hirelings, the People's Commissars and their tools." Unquote. So they publish these kinds of lies to try to turn the people against the Bolsheviks, claiming that the Bolsheviks are German agents and that the Bolsheviks rely on German uh, military forces, etc. Which is just highly hypocritical considering that the counter-revolutionaries themselves solely relied on Entente invasion troops. And you know, they constantly emphasize that Savinkov is a supposed veteran revolutionary. They constantly emphasize that the counter-revolution supposedly is on the side of the workers and peasants, etc. Because they knew that the only way that they could even hope that the population would support them is if they pretended to be revolutionaries themselves. Brave Bolshevik organizer Nakimson was then arrested by the Savinkov White Guards and Mensheviks. They told him to remove his jacket so that they could steal it after shooting him because they didn't want it to be full of bullet holes. And Nakimson simply took off his jacket and shouted to them, you cannot kill the revolution. And then he was shot. Communist organizer Zakheim was also arrested at his home. He also faced his attackers with equal bravery and was then murdered. Their bodies were desecrated and dragged around the streets. And the same fate met many honest workers and communists. Galkin writes, quote, After the bloody massacre of communists, Perkorov created a civil administration at the head of which with the rank of assistant chief, commander of the civil department, Menshevik Savinov was appointed, though mainly the commander was Perkorov himself. Directors of Perkorov's civil administration were Cadet Kisner and landowner Chernoshvitov. Perkorov appointed homeowner Lopatin as city mayor, and as members of the city council were chosen, Menshevik Abramov and Cadet Sobolev, merchant Kayakov, Korolov, and lawyer Meshkovsky." Unquote. But soon all pretense of liberal democracy was abandoned and, quote, Colonel Perkorov declared himself a military dictator in Yaroslavl, unquote. But speaking of Germany, the whites themselves already at this point tried to get the German troops to support them. As Germanis writes, quote, On the night of 6th July, a white officer, using promises alternating with threats, tried to convince the German commission that the German soldiers must be put in action against the Bolsheviks. The German commission stalled for time and replied evasively, unquote. And then once the uprising failed, the whites sought protection from the local German troops. Quote, During this time, the battle was approaching its end. On 20th July, the headquarters of the Volunteer Northern Army of Yaroslavl offered its surrender to the German Commission. In this tragicomical action, there was, however, a certain judicial logic. By becoming prisoners of the Germans, the insurrectionists would come under the protection of Germany and thus escape Bolshevik revenge." Unquote. However, the Bolsheviks did not care and they still arrested the ringleaders and did not allow the Germans to stop them. Despite all their demagogic claims about supposed patriotism and claiming that Bolshevism was backed by Germany, it was actually most of the capitalist class which supported the White Guards 
and all their hirelings that put their hopes not only on the Entente imperialists, but also on the German imperialists. As a Finnish anti-communist historian Toivonen writes, according to Western capitalist eyewitnesses, quote, in particular, the Russian upper classes seem to want to switch from the Bolshevik regime back to the Tsar, if possible, and on the other hand, a German occupation seemed a lesser evil to the current regime, unquote. I'll talk more about this uh, issue of Germany later on in this series. Due to their obvious collaboration with the Whites in the Yaroslavl uprising, the local Menshevik leaders, quote, Dyushin and Savinov were expelled from the Menshevik party because Menshevik leaders Marta Van Dan feared that Menshevik participation in an anti-Bolshevik uprising would provide the Bolsheviks with the excuse they were looking for to justify executions and disbandments, unquote. That is what Brovkin writes. So according to Brovkin, it was only an excuse to repress the Mensheviks when the Mensheviks quite deliberately joined the white car conspiracies. The Mensheviks, of course, did not only participate in the Yaroslavl uprising, they participated in every single major white card uprising. They also participated in the League of Renewal, which organized most of these, and in that case too, they wanted to retain plausible deniability. They wanted to say that, no, it wasn't actually them, or it wasn't actually their fault. They knew what they were doing. Victor Serge writes that, quote, Menshevik Dan stated, we had hoped that the Bolshevik conspiracy could be liquidated by force of arms. The attempt failed. These are Dan's actual words. That is why, he went on, we have taken up the position of conciliation, unquote. So the Mensheviks wanted to overthrow the Bolsheviks with force, but they only denied responsibility for these attempts due to their tactical and dishonest reasons. This is also something that happened to the right SR party, because under the Tsar, the right SR party had always uh, committed acts of terrorism and participated in various armed actions and they had always done it proudly. But when they started doing it against the Bolsheviks, they no longer did it proudly. Instead, they denied responsibility. They claimed that it wasn't actually them or that their party didn't actually support it. The situation caused by the Yaroslavl uprising had become serious because the uprising was planned extremely carefully and with skill. The reactionaries had a favorable situation for their action and had even infiltrated the Soviet state and the Communist Party. The Bolsheviks were also distracted by the left SR coup attempt, which had just taken place in Moscow with backing from the Entente. However, the rebellion was crushed. The Whites knew that they could only win if the Entente invasion troops from Arkhangelsk reached them in time, which testifies to the insignificant degree of popular support they had among the people. Victor Serge writes that, quote, The communists, although surprised by this attack, delivered at the moment when the political conflict with the local left SR branch was occupying all their attention, soon recovered. When the promised descent of the allies from Arkhangel failed to materialize, the whites knew they were lost, unquote. Savinkov, who was later caught, testified at his trial that, quote, I thought at first of operating in Moscow, but the French consul Grenard and General Laverne the latter speaking on M. Nuland's behalf, told me that the Allies felt that it was possible to continue operations against the Germans on the Russian front. They informed me that a sizable landing of Anglo-French forces would be taking place at Arkhangelsk with this purpose in mind, and that it was necessary to support this expedition from the interior. The plan was to occupy the north of the Volga Basin when the British and French would support the insurrection. We were to take Yaroslavl, Rybinsk, Kostroma and Murom. The French would concentrate on Vologda, but they deceived us. The Allied landing did not take place and we found ourselves on our own at Yaroslavl. The French knew all the resources we could call on. I saw Grenard and Laverne several times. The French put money at my disposal. Our own funds, those of the Fatherland and Freedom Defense League, which were on a relatively small scale, came from three sources. There were insignificant donations, I had 200,000 Kerensky rubles via Czech intermediary named Klepando. The French gave about 2.5 million Kerensky rubles. An official brought me the money in small amounts at first. When the insurrection was in the offing, they gave a huge sum all at once. 2 million, I think. Unquote. Savinkov says that the French and the British deceived him. In a way they did, 
According to the capitalist editor of Victor Serge's book, the French and British had promised him too much. They had promised that they would immediately send troops to assist him, but they actually hadn't been able to convince their governments of the reasonableness of this invasion yet. So it seems that they hoped that if the White Guard revolt would show at least some level of success, then they could use that as an argument to tell their governments that the invasion makes sense. And as a result of these things, the invasion then came too late to actually offer effective assistance to the Yaroslav White Guards. Victor Serge writes, quote, Savinkov's activities on the upper Volga were to complement those of the Czechoslovaks and the right SRs farther down the river. A kind of SR government had been functioning for a month in Samara, receiving its directives likewise from M. Nulans. One of the leaders of the SR party at this time, who was also a leading figure in the so-called Constituents Movement, that is the so-called Komuch, the Committee for the Reorganization of the Constituent Assembly, which I will talk about later, wrote, quote, In June, we received an official note from M. Nulans, giving a categorical confirmation of the Allied government's decision to supply forces for joint action against the Germano-Bolsheviks. Such forces were to be large enough to take the weight of the struggle in the first stage and to enable the anti-Bolshevik contingents to form themselves into a big regular army. The Allies rejected any possibility of coexistence with the Bolsheviks. The left SRs too, those sincere and determined adversaries of all these counter-revolutionary groups, appear to have had relations with the French military mission. I have been assured from several quarters that the latter supplied the grenades, which were used in the murder of the German legation. Savinkov testified, I remember one conversation that I had, I think with Grenard. He told me that the French had given facilities for the assassination of Count Murbach by the left SRs, unquote. According to Serge's information, these various parties recruited by the French did not necessarily know about each other's actions and did not always know that they were in cahoots. The French organized a division of labor between them. The Entente imperialists also skillfully used the left SRs. They organized a left SR military mutiny, the so-called Muraviv rebellion, and they also gave support to the left SRs. They assassinated the German ambassador Murbach in order to try to sabotage the peace treaty between Germany and Russia, try to provoke a war with Germany, and then they launched a coup attempt against the Bolshevik government, which was a miserable failure. The Menshevik paper Nasheslovo writes, quote, Yaroslav, July 4th. The left socialist revolutionaries formed their own executive committee of Soviets in opposition to that of the Bolsheviks. The two committees do not recognize each other, unquote. Quote, the attempted insurrection of the left SRs had one jarring echo on the Eastern Front. There the Red Troops, operating against the Czechs and the counter-revolutionary bands, had been placed under the command of Colonel Muraviv, who was a left SR party member. Having received the directive of his party, Muraviv suddenly announced that he considered himself to be at war with Germany, ordered his troops to wheel round towards the east, had the Simbirsk Soviets surrounded and presented himself there to demand their support. He was received in the Soviet by angry shouts, insults and threats. Completely isolated, he was killed on the spot on 12th of July." Unquote. Let's keep in mind that according to Provkin, Mensheviks and SRs also supposedly had a majority support in the Simbirsk Soviet. Yet the population did not join Muraviv in his revolt and he was quote-unquote completely isolated and killed. Quote, when the commander-in-chief Muraviv revolted against the Soviet power, a proof was furnished to the government that he had received sums of money from England. Unquote. Now let's discuss the Menshevik popularity in Yaroslavl. Menshevik I. Rybalski makes up all kinds of lies and accusations against the Bolsheviks, which are not credible, but some of the things he says are important because they contradict Provkin's narrative, and from them we can see the truth peeking through. Rybalski states that in Yaroslavl the Bolsheviks won the Soviet chairman election, although Rybalski calls it fraud, but does not provide any evidence for this claim. Even if there was some truth to some of the things he says, which I'm not sure if there is, but even if there was, there could be a number of perfectly innocent explanations. He then says that some Mensheviks and SRs were taken to court because, quote, Comrade Loktov, an SR, and Comrade Schleifer, Menshevik, 
spoke approvingly about the constituent assembly and disapprovingly about Soviet power and urged the workers to come out with arms against the existing state order." Unquote. This is from a Menshevik document published by Bravkin himself. Bravkin tries to spin this, he writes about this court case elsewhere, but he claims that the Mensheviks and SRs were completely innocent, and honestly, in quite a funny manner, he says in passing that he does not know if these events and accusations of plotting an armed rising had any relation to the armed uprising by Savinkov's White Guards, which took place in the city immediately afterwards and in which the Mensheviks also participated. Now, it would be quite a coincidence if they were not related. Imagine that the Mensheviks and right SRs, they advocate an armed uprising, are taken to court because of it, and then immediately afterwards, an armed uprising actually takes place, organized by white officers, in an organization in which Mensheviks and SRs also participate, and during the actual uprising, the Mensheviks try to recruit workers to join it, but then Bravkin says that, oh, it's all just a coincidence. The Mensheviks, of course, at least afterwards, in cities other than Yaroslavl, claimed that they had won the Yaroslavl election. The Mensheviks and Brovkin, however, do not provide any good evidence for this, but it is still possible. Yaroslavl was a place where the Black Hundreds and clericalism were stronger than elsewhere, the Bolsheviks were temporarily weakened because the left SRs tried to overthrow them and created a rival Soviet executive committee, which, for some reason, Bravkin does not mention, even though it might well be relevant. Some historians have also claimed that the Bolsheviks had a majority in the Yaroslavl Soviet because of votes from soldiers, but that they would have lost the majority when the soldiers were sent to the front or left for their villages. However, I've never seen any evidence for this. In any case, it is of course possible, but Brovkin only hints at it elsewhere and doesn't mention anything of the sort relating to Yaroslavl. Maybe because it didn't happen, or maybe because in that case the change in the Soviet wouldn't have been because of any change in the attitude of the population or in the attitude of the working masses, but due to simple changes in class forces and revolutionary segments of the population simply being moved elsewhere. For the sake of objectivity and fairness, I must say that it is possible, but Bravkin doesn't demonstrate it. Galkin, of course, mentions that the workers' movement in Yaroslavl was weakened severely during World War I because active workers were arrested or sent to the front lines en masse. This helps to explain why Bolshevism was relatively weaker in Yaroslavl compared to other places, but despite of that, the Bolsheviks gained majority support there after the October Revolution, as everyone recognizes. One must also ask the obvious question that, if the Mensheviks supposedly had such great popularity among the workers and toiling masses, then why did they feel that their only chance of success was this kind of conspiracy, where they allied themselves with white generals and a czarist officer's plot, relying on invasion troops of the Entente, and they were also totally funded by the Entente? Why did they feel like they even needed to ask the German troops to help them if the Entente invasion failed? And then, why did the workers refuse to join the Menshevik plot? The reality is that the workers did not support the Mensheviks, they did not support this uprising, and the Mensheviks knew that they had to lie to the workers and try to trick them into joining it, because otherwise they wouldn't, and even that didn't work. 